Uh, hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch, and I've been doing a series of webinars to keep everybody entertained and educated during the pandemic. Today, my guests are, are Sharon and Laura Wilsey. They're back for the fourth time. Somebody said, what are we going to talk about on the fourth time? And I said, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I have a series of videos that um, Laura Plunkett uh, sent to me. She was my guest last week. We were talking about animal communication and what the animals, what she was feeling in the, in the horses while they were on surefoot pads. And one of these horses that she had was really quite interesting in some of his behaviors. So um, hopefully I can find the correct video. I'll be searching for that because I couldn't find it before we got started. But um, I'm sure that we'll find something to talk about for the next hour, as we always do. Um, Sharon and Laura, please just give them a little introduction for people that may not have tuned in before. Sure. Okay, so hi there. I'm Sharon Wilsey. And I'm Laura Wilsey. All right. And so uh, we are coming from the uh, horse speak perspective. I wrote a book called Horse Speak, uh, and a couple other books in that vein. And so if you haven't heard of that before, uh, what Horse Speak is about is the, it was the study of micro gestures. So it's an overarching theme of how horses use their postures, their signals. Uh, gestures, micro movements, breath messages, eye messages, for an overall understanding of their language system. So that's what Horse Speak is about. It was interesting that you said something about animal communicating because uh, people sometimes say what's what's similarities and difference. And Horse Speak is really based on on the evidence that was gathered over many many years and a lot of uh, testing that's been done in the field as far as bringing this all over the world, meeting horses from every walk of life, donkeys, mules, and uh, generating an, an understanding of not only what horses are doing with their micro gestures to communicate with each other, but how we can be adaptive, even though our body is a totally different structure. We have hands, they don't. We have a very short neck, a very long neck. So things that are very, very different, little nose, they have a little <laughs> nose. Um, but even though that is the case, there are certain things that are intrinsic. And so when you um, arrive at the intrinsic gesture, posture, or movement, the horses will understand you very quickly because that movement is, is organically understandable between mammals. So this has been a really cool process and it's different from animal communicating because animal communicating is, I would say, actually taking into account, I think a good animal communicator, um, their brain is taking into account a lot of what's called decoding and encoding. Decoding is how you break it down and understand the information coming at you. And then encoding is how you put it together and give off a nonverbal uh, language communication. So I think when you're an animal communicator, there's a certain amount of that that you're good at. But then there's people who can do communication like over the phone and they're just looking at a picture of the animal. So they have a snapshot of micro gestures. Uh, I think that there's a, there's a similarity in that um, we, there's a lot of stuff about our brain and our nervous system that we just don't know. We don't know a whole bunch of stuff. As much as we know, there's more that we don't know. So I think it's entirely possible that a person's intuition is something that gets developed with uh, nonverbal communication hand in hand. Uh, there's been a lot of studies done with people who are blind from birth who have intrinsic body gestures. So they've never seen somebody else do it, so it's not mimicry. But, you know, they say, you know, they get startled and they go like this. You know, there's things that, that they do. That snoring is my dog in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that there's, there's sort of a way that these things tie in together. But Horse Speak is specifically about learning to see, observe, uh, cognitively understand the separation of gestures and what they mean and the categories that they're in, as well as developing an empathic response that's accurate and appropriate to not only for what I'm feeling, but for the horse's uh, feeling in the moment as well. So that would be that. So what's, what's fun about watching Surefoot <clears throat> is the horses are expressing a lot. So oh, I, sure. I, get, I just, have fun. just to kind of throw something in here. So basically, um, horse speak is looking at the physical gestures that the horse is making and understanding it from the communication of horse to horse communication. Correct. And then 
animal communication. So this is one of the things because I've watched you and I know that there's a certain level of intuitiveness when you're working. And I actually think that all the horse trainers have a certain amount of intuitiveness because that's what makes them good is to pick up on the subtle things. But we're all electromagnetic energy. Right. And so we're all emitting an energy and it's that energy and whether or not there's a blockage in the energy. And I'm not talking like woo-woo energy. I'm talking truly electromagnetic energy yes. like the planet that each person and each horse emits that. Because one of the things we see with Surefoot is that after a couple hours of, of putting horses on pads at a workshop, everybody looks doped up. Yeah, and that's because the horse is such a huge electromagnetic field. And as that field goes into a more tranquil state, all of those around it go into a more tranquil state. Um, we pick up on it. And in fact, there was a really interesting post that just came up on my um, Surefoot Equine Facebook page. Uh, a woman had put one horse on the pads and this other horse came and And I don't know if you saw it, Sharon, because he lined up behind the first horse and let down. <laughs> Right. And somebody, I said, it would be really interesting to have Sharon interpret that. But, you know, he just came right over and just got tucked. tucked here's the one horse and he tucked in right behind. Wow. And then the two of them just zonked. Right. Wow. Yeah. So That's, I'd have to see it to say specifically, but I'll, I'll probably be able to pick up at some point. But OK. So what have you got um, some uh, what do you want to start with? We did not. We did play with the pads. We didn't end up filming. When That's fine. Tell us a little bit about what you played with and then we can go from there. We had, uh, let's see, we did Rocky and he was really loving having the slants on the front feet. Yeah, that was different for him. So he, tell him a little bit about just, just briefly when you did the pads with him from the last time. Okay. So he, um, he had had colic surgery in November, a pretty extensive surgery. It was a long recovery. Um, he's had a little bit of edema in uh, the in, inner thigh of his hind legs and around the groin. And so um, we've been working with different ways to help, you know, we basically a lot of walking and so forth. But <clears throat> we started doing these calls with Wendy and I was like, you know what, we should put him back on the pad. So <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, that, you know. So we st he had the edema, I would say, is the biggest thing has gone down since we've been using the pads consistently. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, but uh, I, I have not. So that's why that's really cool that you've seen a reduction in edema just and using which was there any specific pad that he really liked? Was it He's, he really awesome? digs the slants. He likes the slants. I he think really he likes those. those. Yeah. And he, he wanted them in the back for the longest time. And he wanted then he wanted the, the bigger the trauma pad. The, yes, the physio pad. The physio phys, pad. Yeah, he wanted that on one of his hind legs. He didn't want it on any other foot. And then and he wanted the slants in the front. So you know, and he was rocking and he doesn't use them for very long. He used them seven to 10 minutes. That's it. Tops. Oh, that's actually a fairly long time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we short... have another horse that'll stay on there for 15 minutes. She's like, I ain't coming off these. <laughs> okay. The short is uh, like five seconds or less. Oh, okay. Uh, and then, you know, like a couple of minutes. So anything over five minutes is actually long. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. In that fact, actually is a second. She puts her like she does, she mostly puts the tip of her hoof on the pad, and then yeah. she'll think about it for like one or two seconds, and then she's and then she's done. Yeah. But we have the two of the mares won't get off. They get mm -hmm. on and they're like just and yeah. They're they're in in alone. With Dakota, we ended up doing a slant on the front left, I think, and oh, yeah. then the hard um, pad in the back. So we staggered slant, slant. Um, so it's diagonal. Diagonal yeah. on both, all four. On the front. So I have a question about the horse that just rests the toe. Yeah. When you're watching that horse, what do, what signs do you see from horse speak perspective? What what are you reading there? Um, you know, it's really interesting for me because she likes to put her nose on it, and she actually and you and I have questioned like you know they have so many nerve endings in between the nostrils and that front lip. There's such a, an amount of of nerve endings and there's an acupuncture point. There's so much going on, and and we, you and I have both seen the horses will sometimes put their nose on the pad, and it's like something happens in their brain. Yes, this is so she likes that. She likes to put her nose She's on it. Really nosy with it, and then it really rest for a yeah. moment, and then you could put it under, and she'll put it on a foot. She'll put a foot down, and then go, no, that's not what I want. And we go around all four feet until you find. And she always wants this one hind leg, and she's um, she tripped and fell when she was a baby, so. There's no obvious signs of stress or trauma, but you know she's a little wonky. So um, 
she likes to put that toe there. And when she does that, her whole pelvis tilts. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So she's actually letting down in the pelvis. Yeah. Resting the toe. She's kind of resting the leg. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because I recently had a person, um, Alex has a, a thoroughbred off the track, and he he uh, stood her in front on the physio, but then he kind of reacted like nervous, so she went to the back, but he does the toe touching sampling, and that's not uncommon. Um, I didn't know if you saw any particular uh, shift in their body reaction other than the pelvis lowering or expression in their face when they're doing that. You know, I do, I do see them, I see Luna when she's doing that, um, I'm looking for the eyes. There's always a change in the eyes. And, and you know, the eyes and the ears will often go together. So if an ear goes this way, the, that's where the eye is looking. Oh. So, so as an ear, so if an ear flicks to Laura, the eye is looking at Laura. The other ear is looking this way, that eye is focusing on something this way. So <clears throat> they can't do like a lizard, and, but they can, but because the pupil, the shape of the pupil, they, they can see all the way around. What the brain is taking in, what they're focusing on shifts. And so I notice her really swivel those ears and, and her eye changes. And then usually she arrives or her eye goes inward. And it's like, it's, it's a heavy lidded, um, withdrawn. She's not really looking at anything. The ears get set. And that's her one second. That's her one second of going inward. And she's like, I'm done with that. <laughs> yeah. And so it's interesting because, uh, you know, I get questions all the time from people. Uh, my horse wouldn't stand the pads or, uh, and that's what, you know, my horse walks off, but I always tell people that's so totally okay because they know their body better than we do. And it may be profound to them, just that little tiny moment. Yes. Whereas, you know, we kind of have an expectation because other people say, oh, my horse stays, like you said, five to seven minutes. Wow, that's short. I'm like, no, that's really long. Um, but until you've done a lot of horses, you don't see the gamut. In other words, right. if you have two horses, you're seeing one horse and two horse, and that's where your, uh, your perspective is. But when you've done 10 horses, it's here, and 50 horses, it's here, and 100 horses, and pretty soon, you know, I've been doing this for eight years. But it's hard for the individual person to, to sort of reference where their horse is on that continuum when they're by themselves. You know what's interesting? Um, as, you, as you talk, I'm thinking, well, Luna's got a, a sort of an interesting background where her mother was accidentally bred at two years old and was, was sent to a rescue and was a real trauma case and had ex extreme, she was wrapped up in some barbed wire and, and on, ripped up all kinds of, so there's emotional trauma, there was physical trauma. Someone tried to work with her and she was so scared she tried to jump out of the window of the stall and got hung up. So, that, so when we adopted that mother horse, she was just basically just walking cortisol, like she was just a stress bot. And we were working, we didn't know she was pregnant, had no idea. So we were working oh through that whole first uh, several months of having her just to help her relax, which took a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. And so then all of a sudden we realized, oh my God, she's about to give birth. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not the birth. first one where that's happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but you know, she, had, she was very, very stressful. And even after the baby was born, she was still very high energy. And now she's- No stripy lead ropes. No, yeah, you could, there's <laughs> the, million, the list of things you can't do was really long with this horse. And, her, and the baby would step up. So like you would go to put a halter on the mother and she'd just have a panic attack. And the baby would go put the halter in and look at the mother and be like, look, look, you know, like soothing the mother and helping. The baby was very stable and very calm. And this is the same horse who now has a hard time calming down herself in a different way. Now the mother is stable and calm mm -hmm. and really present. Oh, wow. And so, I, you know, I've postulated this with some other, you know, Psycho human psychotherapists who talk about developmental and, and stress in the womb. And, and, yeah. Yeah. And the emotional trauma of having a, a the chemical milieu that the baby was in in the mother. And there's a lot of research on that in humans. But then the having to be the parent to yes. the mother who couldn't yeah. parent. There's and a then lot of research on that too. <laughs> right. And there's a ton of stuff. And then later on, what ha you know, what happens in people is you unravel at a certain point. At a certain point, your nervous system goes, I gotta, I gotta let this go, but I don't know how to do it. Right, right. Um, and so then there's a whole traumatic process of kind of the the awareness and then the process of letting go, which you can relate to other horses with PTSD, that same kind of trauma that we see horses 
go, let go. And do you see a particular, from horse speak perspective, do you see a particular pattern with horses that have PTSD in terms of their communication? Yes, yes. And, and Luna reminds me of that, even though, you know, in my conscious mind, I'm like, I've raised her her whole life. And up until a few years ago, she was, uh, her education was going at a steady pace. And then it's like she had this re sharp and sudden reversal where it's like she went back to square one. And I, I, would, I think that since the pads have been a part of it, we, there's a lot of things we're doing, sure. but the pads have been a part of it. She, the way that the pads access whatever it is, the cerebellum or whatever it's accessing in the nervous system, in the brain, it's interesting to see her use the pads and then um, want to go for a ride. Oh, which riding is now her big, she was really dependable and you could count on her. And now riding is emotionally stressed. She wants to, she'll run to you. She'll open her mouth for the bit. She'll be like, get on, she'll line up at the mountain, like get on. And then you start riding. And then it's like, it's, I can't, you know, she, she loses had, it. had um, a really bad tooth adjustment. And so we have been working with an occlusal therapist for the last couple of years, which has made leaps and bounds difference. Mm -hmm. in her balance after the last two, wow. two balancing we had with her she would be petrified to go down hills with me on her back oh sure yes yeah. because like, there's so much proprioception that's happening in the job yes and then yeah. the yes. day after we had her teeth done confidence going down those hills so but she would be the one she would literally running and wipe out on the ground oh, just wow. just fall so was, her yeah. balance was really you know troubled so now yeah, we're just back to square one. And the biggest thing that we found with Luna just in her overall personality and communication is how important the boundary is with yeah. her, is that she needs to have her six inches and we have, you know, we have our line that we yep. can't cross with her because she will, you know, she gets upset and then she'll invade my space and basically step on my foot. And, and let me explain <laughs> what, what we mean about that yeah. for those who don't know. So, um, if you want to think about human psychology for a moment in like a toddler and toddlers need a boundary, they need to know and they push the boundary because they need to know where it is mm -hmm. and they're going to push it. You can count on it that they're going to push it, but they need you to deliver a consistent boundary, but not an angry boundary, right. you know, not a, not a, a boundary of um, discipline. frustration or discipline, but just a consistent, this is the line and it's okay if you have that. And that's now where she's at. So that's what Laura is talking about. And, right. so and that's clear objective and horses, humans, and dogs all need really clear about Cats, forget it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Rondo <laughs> has been up in my lap a few times already during the call. <laughs> so I think with PTSD horses, um, my experience with them is that they have got stunted. It's like they got mentally, emotionally stunted at some stage of uh, emotional development. And I mean, horses can live, some of them can live up to 40 years old. And so you think about an animal that has that kind of longevity, you look at an elephant, you know, they have such longevity and how long it takes for those babies to grow up. And there's been a lot of research on the psychosocial development of elephants, but there really hasn't been qualitative research on psychosocial development of horses. So we're just sort of winging it and saying, well, I've seen this and I've seen that and it looks like this, it looks like that, but we haven't really studied it. So Luna's the horse that had to be responsible for her mother who was, yeah. and the whole bit, and. And so there's, there's so much about the connection. I'm, I'm working on having an equine dentist that's used Surefoot as a guest because the teeth connection is so important. And I've actually seen this with another horse where they, they did too much. And for years, she was so depressed because she couldn't, con uh, you know, her teeth didn't touch. Yeah. And, um, and she lost all proprioceptive feeling. And I wonder if that isn't even part of the boundary issue that says you don't know where they are in space anymore in the same right. way because they've lost proprioception. And that's where the pads can be really useful in helping establish proprioception, but she is also the horse that will only rest her toe. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that's it, right. it's really, this is starting to become yeah. a very full picture of yeah. a horse with a lot of subtle uh, uh, sort of issues from different aspects that are kind of all culminating into this one place. And of course, yeah. it's a it's got to be a holistic approach. Just doing pads isn't going to be sufficient, but right, right. the teeth, the feet, and it's really cool. That's a, yeah. a fascinating horse. Yeah. She's fascinating, and yeah, we've done. She's had acupuncture and chiropractic, and um, the beamer, and like lots of interesting things. I do Reiki, and so body work 
are us, you know? <laughs> like, what do you need to, I mean, and she'll tell you, what's fascinating about my horses at this point, because we are so holistically minded, it's like, what, what's gonna happen? When someone shows up for them, they basically line up and go, you're here to service us. We know that. <laughs> yes. So Catherine Wyckoff, my, uh, my friend and fellow Feldenkrais practitioner and Surefoot practitioner, um, she works at a therapeutic riding center and they do a spa day for the horses. Mm. And they set out the beamer and the Surefoot pads and some other stations and they turn the horses loose and they let the horses choose their station. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. And, and she says a lot of the horses will go over and stand at specific pads. You know, that's what they want. You that's know what else I, I've done? It, that is so fascinating. I've done tuning forks. Mm. Oh. And uh, most of my horses love the tuning fork on the dock of the tail. And they'll just stand and like the ears flop sideways. And I have a whole range, the Solfeggio range. And I'll, I'll hit different. And sometimes they like them on the ting point at the bottom mm -hmm. of the, the fetlock. I'm uh, not the fetlock, the, um, the cornet band. Uh, cornet band. And so that's a really fun, yeah, and I think spa day is yeah. great. And, and what we refer to that in, in my books and stuff, I call that just enrichment. And, yeah. and how can enrichment be part of what you're doing? Because of course, um, the, the panel you and I and, and Lynn Tellington Jones were on, the question they asked us is why is being calm important? Right. Why, why is a calm horse important? And that was the question, you know, and it's like, yeah, because if your horse isn't calm, emotionally if they're not calm energetically if their nervous system is over firing if they're on you know they're they're way up and sympathetic they're not going to be able to focus they're not going to be able to learn they're they're in a, a level of fight or flight mode you don't you know that's not really the horse that you want to right ride. and that's you know the thing is what i love is that we can always equate that to people too uh, that because we're mammals and we have the vagal system and I have uh, Violet and he's coming back on Thursday to talk more about Vegas, especially during this pandemic. But we, we all, all mammals have that vagal system, polyvagal system. And so we resonate on these similar levels. Um, and tuning forks, if you're wondering about that, again, we're talking about frequencies. So vibration, um, you know, the, it, as much as we can't necessarily see those things, we do feel those things. Um, and this is where Bob, uh, Bob Balker talks about the sensory organ of the hoof and how it's picking up vibrations from the earth and it has different types of sensors to pick up either fast receptors or slow receptors. So you see that as we keep doing these webinars, all these ideas start to tie together. And that's the whole point is to right. create this uh, holistic, more enriched picture, not just for the horses, but for all of us so that we can understand what's going on. You know, it's interesting that you say about their, their they pick up vibration through the hooves they also listen through their hooves yeah so they hear the footfalls of other horses and it gives information so and we talk about stomping too tell us yes. about that yeah so human beings we tend to do weird stuff with our feet we either <laughs> shuffle along or we move too fast or we tippy toe we don't make any sound at all and we're just not we tend to not be that grounded and anchored in just a rhythmic if you watch a uh, what I call a mentor horse, that's one of the lead horses that's actually a guidepost for everyone to like, it's okay, we're all gonna be calm, it's okay. You know, they move like this. It's rhythmical, it's predictable. They don't, the, the other horse might be stressed and running and that mentor, he, they just, he or she just stays right here. So for human beings to start this, I'll say to people, you know, march like you're in a marching band, just to get the rhythm, because people can think marching band rhythm and stomping to a stop, because so many people stop, not stop. Mm. They stop and then they dally with another foot and then the horse moves because you moved. <laughs> and so then you go, what are we doing with your foot? And the horse says, I don't know, are we moving? And you say, I don't know. And then you say, stop, stop, stop on the rope. And they go, well, darn, just, why didn't you stop? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, I see it so often that someone's leading a horse and they stop, but they haven't considered the momentum and the length of time it takes. Think of a long bus, mm -hmm. how long it takes to stop. And so they stop really abruptly and think the horse should figure it out. But, you know, it, it makes more sense to prepare and ease into as opposed to just stop because you've got right. the momentum of this huge, you know, 1400 pound body that's still traveling forward. And if we don't kind of ease into it, it's right. I think it's really hard for the horse. It, it is. It's definitely hard. So if you're if you are thinking marching band, you have a rhythm. And what people 
<clears throat> often do is they try to m go as fast as what they think the horse is going to go, or they have this idea, I need to get there, and they move too fast, and a lot of horses are like, if you, so horses are reading your energy. You talked about energy a minute ago. So if you're moving fast, your energy, your posture, your gestures are saying, I'm in a rush, I'm stressed, we gotta get there. So you can still get there in a reasonable amount of time, but have rhythm and grace in your movement because right. then they're listening, they're listening to your feet. And when you prepare to stop, there's, you don't have to like do this, I'm gonna to prepare to stop in three or four steps. You could just say, and I'm stopping. Exactly. And I love and I think of and as half halt. Yes. You know, I'll say and walk and trot and halt. And that gives everybody as opposed to halt, you know, and it's so yes. abrupt and giving everybody, but you also do something with stomping. Like I've seen you do that. What, what's that all about? Stomp to a stop. Stomp to a stop. No, I, no, like when you're, when you're in a herd and you have horses and you stomp your foot. Oh, you're okay. Saying something. That I, if I'm in a herd and I stomp my foot, it's, it's to get attention on me now. Okay. So like you'll see a horse. Um, oh, this was really funny. We were in an indoor arena and there was three horses turned loose and one was being introduced to the two boys uh, for the first time ever. And they were going to try to, this pony had been around in several places and he didn't, didn't get along with anybody. So they had brought, it was a huge indoor arena. Um, so they brought him in so he could kind of meet these two. One of the horses was a mentor and the other horse is what I call a joker. So oh, yeah. the joker's like, he, ha, 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 what can I get into? So the the joker tried to approach the the new pony who was very defensive and was like don't even look at me he was like way cold and lonely at the far way end. cold and lonely at the far end <laughs> yeah. um and then finally so i went to the joker and i get, i modeled some greeting behaviors for the joker that i knew he wasn't thinking of and then the joker went to the mentor and the mentor looked at me and said good idea and modeled the exact same exact same stuff to the joker and then the, the mentor turned, put his nose on a wall, which is a signal that says, I'm holding a safety spot. You go, you go do it. I've got, I'm going to hold still here. So I'm pretty predictable. The Joker goes over to the pony and does the exact same greeting. And the pony's like that I can do. Wow. And then he, the Joker starts to bring the pony over and they started to maybe play a little bit. Now at this moment, back to the stop at this moment, the mentor says, no, that's not appropriate he yet. He kicks the wall. He kicked with his front oh. foot. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Yeah. He's like, no, that's boys. That's all he did. We're not doing this. And they said, ooh, I guess we're not doing that. So if I'm out there and I want attention now to me, I will make a stomp for to make a statement. I put right. my foot down. Well, I thought about that the other day and I was out, so there's three horses and I've had more time to spend with them where Al lives. And there's um, a Welsh cob. And he's a joker. He's always fooling around and messing around. And I went out to, to catch them to bring him in for dinner. And he was kind of messing around. And I thought, well, let me give this a try. And I stomped my foot. And he went, whoa, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, just like that, whoa, you know, like, you stomp your foot. You're serious. And I was like, yeah. wow, that's really cool. And it's exactly what he needed, you know, just like, yeah. hey, cut it out, pay attention. And he did. Yeah, yeah, it is really fascinating that, the, and we we even have a saying for it. You know, I'm going to put my foot down about this. Yeah. Like, again, it's so fascinating. We we tend to not think about the origin of some of the expressions that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and then when something like this comes up, you're like, oh, my goodness, I've said that for years. Or, you know, I've known of that expression for years, but I hadn't really thought about consciously what that means or what, what that's doing. So that's really, really cool. You know, it, when you're talking about that, here's an interesting one people ask me a lot. How do you say I'm done? Oh yeah. How do you say I'm done? So one, you take your hand and one swish with your hand. And we actually have, there's a human gesture that we, you know, we'll go, oh, I'm so done with that. Uh, oh yeah. So that's a <laughs> tail swish. <laughs> and so when you're done, if let's so like when a horse is ready to come off the surefoot pads and they're ready to be done, a lot of times you'll see that tail swish. Yeah, so that's so cool that, um, yeah, because that's such, a, again, such an innate reaction that we have to things like, oh, you know, out of my sight, right? right. And, and that's a tail, go away, I'm done with you. How yeah. cool. I, again, I hadn't thought about that. Um, somebody's talking about in the army, they teach a preparatory command. And when um, Allie Thurston and I used to teach drill team, we found out that ho is actually the preparatory word. So... Uh, or that actually, sorry, not the preparatory word, but the action word. So you'd say in drill team, you'd say walk, 
ho or trot, ho, and you did the action on the ho. So that was actually the, the prepare and then execute. So, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And All right. So I, one more thing about our friend who was the cold and lonely man in the indoor. When we were done with the session, I don't know, it was about a half hour or so, Sharon was working with the boys and everything. And at the end of the day, all three boys were laying down together. Oh. So mm -hmm. our friend found a home. Yes. So if you do, if you say, I want to be done to a horse and you buy your thigh, because it doesn't work up, up tall like this, because we don't have tails in front. They have tails in back. <laughs> so you, got, you got to bring it down by your thigh. But you don't want to go wiggle, 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 because that's a different tail swish. Oh, that's like okay. I'm so done with you. Go. That's a frustrated yeah. tail swish. So just a one by your thigh swish with your hand. And I've had horses, I do that motion and they just stop and they go, oh, okay, I guess I'm done too. And they turn around and walk and they do one tail swish back at me. They're looking over their shoulder like, yeah, okay, I'm done with you too. It's so cool. <laughs> really cool. Well, yeah. we're not done yet. We've got more to do. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'd like to do is pull up some of this video from Laura's talk the other day. Um, this is a horse, his name is Hunter, and um, he was rather shut down. Um, and Laura started working with him and using the Surefoot pads, but he did some stuff that I haven't seen, you know, like I've been doing this for eight years and you'd think I'd seen just about everything and I haven't. So he did some interesting uh, movements and actions with his head and neck and his feet. And so we wanted to show it to you and get your take on it. Okay, cool. Okay, so I'm just not gonna, give me a second here to pull it up. And Colleen, who is on the chat, she was with us that day. Yeah, yeah. When, she said, uh, Jackson's awesome. Yeah, that's, that such that's a who we're talking day. about. Yeah. And another lady had said that she's trying to get horse feet from the local uh, library. library. So that's awesome. Okay. Okay, now I'm not sure this is the, the, she sent me a whole bunch of videos and unfortunately I couldn't find the ones specifically. So I had to download all of them. Sure, but sure. I, okay, so I'm just gonna let this, yeah, this is one of them. Um, and he had, when she started with him, um, he had been really, really tight over his, uh, from his right hip down to his stifle to his point of his buttocks on the right side. Um, and after Martina's talk, we were looking at it and I think really it was fascia that was tight. But yeah. this, this is after, it was, that was on the other side, the right hind leg. Right. But this is um, after um, working with him. I think this is another day. Mm. And it was so interesting how he kept lifting and putting down his foot and at the same time, extending his, his throat latch. Yeah. You, you know what that says to me? He's using his core and he's using what for us would be the adductors, the inner thigh, the, the gripper muscles that we ride with on the inner thigh. That's mm -hmm. what he's using. That's why he's on the same pad. And see right there, he just used his inner thigh muscles to lift himself up. So, so he, I've got my so point here. Using upper, his, his overt muscles. So let's, I'll just play this again. In fact, I'll just do it a little bit slower. Um, when he's using, when he's stretching out his chin and his throat, that's like a, that's like a core move. Like a, when you, when a baby's crawling, when they're learning to lift up. Yeah. Because I, I have, a, I have my grandsons here. Yes. So so when when they're learning to lift up, they do this. It's a core move. And look, that's what he's doing. He's using. Hang on, I'm going to make sure that we can see you on the screen yeah. while, while we're, yeah. Um, and we'll just see if we can just, there you go. And so I'm just going to drag this because it's really interesting to see how much he's extended his chin forward. Yeah. Right there. And I'm okay. not, that's not something that I typically see. Right. Right. And there you see he's, he's drawn in a little bit. Right. Right. With the foot coming down and then he starts to extend it. Oh, well, wow. It's really interesting because here, if I just play it slowly, you can yes. see the extension and association with the leg picking. Yeah, look up. at the see core. It. Can you see the core yeah, move? The yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all in here, right? All in there. And the inner thigh is what he's activating and working with because he's so, whatever the tension is in, in the lower back and the, um, the, the back of the, what is it? Like, it would be the sit bone for us. So the, Yeah, so the hamstrings. Is, yes, um, yeah. And that's so tight on him. But if, if he can get those, the inner thigh moving upward. That's it really interesting. He kind of really slams it down there and then pushes right. a little bit and then takes the weight off. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll just, she just comes around to the side a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you can see he's really trying to figure something out. Yeah. Like here he's really opened his throat latch and extended. It's almost like he has a groin pull. Yeah, 
Yeah, because it's so, now I'll go back and find an earlier you video. Because... Feel that, see that, all the, the flexing and the using, the inner thigh and the, uh, the, the lower part of his abdomen. And of course, uh -huh. you'd have to lift with your chest and extend your throat and up to your chin. So if anyone who's ever done Pilates or yoga, you, you know, this is like um, Cobra. Yeah, wow. Okay, so I'm just gonna pause for a second and then find another video. Um, okay, it's gonna stop my screen share while I'm doing that. And if you guys can just, oh yeah, hyoid. We're, we're gonna have um, Jillian Kreinbring uh, on the 25th. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that she'll talk about hyoids. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have a great, uh, our occlusal therapist is always talking to us about the, I know more about the hyoid now. I actually have a horse skull here that lives with me now from her. Um, and she's like a little hyoid bone and where it, all the, and how it's like a gyroscope of, of, of balance for the entire body. And I was like. Yeah, hyoid, is, and all, that whole thing, jaw, hyoid, th uh, throat, all the muscles that, there's like 20 muscles that attach to the hyoid. Some, there's ones that attach to the sternum and to the inside of the shoulder blade. So this direct connection from the foot up through uh, the hyoid connections to the tongue. So, yeah. and of course the back. I mean, it's, it's- The thing that was really fascinating is like talking about the different skeletal structures of different breeds. And when, you know, like a quarter horse, like I have, she isn't going to collect- Oh, speaking of the hyoid. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, she's not going to be able to collect because she'll actually stop breathing because the the position of the hyoid. And so other, you know, like Frisians or Andalusians, their hyoid is placed differently so that they can actually collect Go with like that higher neck. The higher neck. Collection. Yeah. And yeah. and some horses are really tight. Um, they're like the distance here, if I put, use my pointer, the distance mm -hmm. between the jaw and the neck some in some horses this is a very narrow space and so yes. when they come onto the vertical they literally pop out the parotid glands because there's no space exactly yeah. yeah all right so this is actually an earlier this is probably the beginning video okay. and um here he is now on the pad with the right hind foot lifted and this was the area on this side where we saw a lot of tension in the before videos right you know, and we can see, again, he's kind of working out something there. Um, like, it's much more quiet. It's an earlier yeah. session. So it's the eye. Like that's the, the inward eye. eye. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the inward eye. And so the ears are paying attention to the world. And the, but the eye has gone inward. And even when he gets a distraction, um, he's still going inward. Okay, so pause it right there for a second, just for facial expression, because this is yeah. great. So people can watch. So... Oh, As the definitely. ears are scoping back and forth, there you can tell the difference between when, when an ear hears a sound external versus when an ear, his ears are actually listening to his own body. So one of the things is that horses have about 13 buttons. They actually have probably 200, but they have, for, for our purposes, they have about 13 buttons along the body that they use as communication hotspots. So communication centers, they have different practical and emotional meaning and when the horses are self-talking, they also use their same buttons. So in this, in what he's doing here, when the ears are going forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards, he's scanning his own buttons. So you can, you'll see that. And every time he scans a button, then he has a mouth movement, and then he has an aha moment. So he's moving right now through and feeling and getting information as we would think through something, as we would literally chew something over and think something over and we have to all, we do we make changes we make adjustments in our posture we make we change the way we're sitting we go oh and lean our head to the other side instead of to this side so that's literally what he's doing is he's thinking but the expression is very clear through the body and you can actually watch the wave of thought go mm -hmm. from the tip of his nose to the tip of his tail and down his feet and back again so it's waving through there see it waved through and then back and his head went uh-huh yeah and there goes his lip yeah yep and he goes aha uh -huh. and then there's that and then there's another wave going all the way through it got stuck at the oh shoulder. yeah so it got stuck at the shoulder there oh yeah right and it's going to move he'll be able to move that through the shoulder right there and he said aha uh -huh. and then he came forward again and then he's going to bring the thought back and see if he can get back past so he's interestingly as he's as much as he's doing in his pelvis I would say um, visibly on the side, it looks like the shoulder was probably the sternum because of what we saw him doing next. So 
he's he's bringing consciousness to the upper part of his body and there's something there is stuck and then he has a little bit that goes all the way back and then comes back and then so he's figuring out how to work that through by standing on the pads i think wendy what i like about the pads like all the other things that we do for horses and they love masterson method and tuning forks and all these things but we do it for them we do it sort of yeah. to them and they use the pads yeah they have agency yes that's an excellent word they have agency they can choose how long which foot which density whether they stand with a toe whether they walk off like he's just standing with one foot cocked and the other down yeah right. that's I, I that's a really great word i'm gonna latch on to that yeah definitely um, We've got a couple questions. So while you look at the questions, um, I'm gonna pull up another video. I think it's the one right after that. Um, but there's a question, let's see this. Um, uh, do you talk about the buttons in your book? Yes. Yes. And yeah. why is it so important just to leave the horse alone? Oh, that's an excellent question, Loretta. So Loretta, imagine you're having massage and after the massage, you're in that really, really peaceful state and somebody comes over and goes mussing with your hair and fussing with you and patting you and all. How would you feel? <laughs> yeah. I can't do it in person, but I can do it through the camera. Um, so, you know, we want to allow the horse time to integrate the information. And if we watch Dr. Peters um, talks about the brain, we get, we get the lick and chew and that's dopamine. But if we leave them longer and they're in a safe place, they go into a deeper level where there's serotonin. Mm -hmm. Serotonin is your feel good hormone. And during that serotonin release, it's, he talks about the dendritic scaffolding. So to make a new, new connection, you have to wire together the neurons. You literally have to like build little highways between them and wire them together. Right. And so serotonin is your chemical that's going to help build the dendritic scaffolding to make the connection between neurons so that now you have another thought, another uh, awareness, another conscious idea, another possibility. And so by disturbing them, we actually interrupt that process of the serotonin and the dendritic scaffolding being built. And so it's really important to just leave them just like you to let you rest when you have, you know, you're processing through something. And Sharon, if you want to add anything to that, go for it. Yeah, I, um, I, I just went into chemistry too. And I, I work with some horses sometimes who, and I'm not, an, I'm not an expert at this, but what I would say is the other thing that you get is, is horses who are addicted to endorphins, mm. which is a morphine drip, really. And, that's, and you get endorphins like runner's high. And that's horses that are weaving and cribbing, and they're, they're doing some activity that's releasing and it's not dopamine and it's not leading to serotonin. So they're never getting that letdown and that release. So um, what I, I've had to work with horses using communication to see if I can help them and um, working on this spot right here, because it's also how they do seeking behaviors and seeking behaviors releases dopamine for anybody that just go shopping. Like when we can go shopping again, <laughs> we'll be seeking for sales. And we'll be all on dopamine. It'll be great. So <laughs> people shop. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, right now we're just looking at Instagram, getting my dopamine fix. Yeah. <laughs> but so the, like when you're, when you said that about the serotonin, I was like, oh yeah, this is yet another way to help a horse shift if they've had, even if they're not necessarily in pain now, but if they went through a pain cycle and learned to get the endorphin drip instead of the dopamine drip, they could have gotten caught in that cycle. So horses that had pain, but haven't been able to shift back to um, normalize, normalizing to get back to a good homeostasis. And so when you're seeing like this horse with the, you know, whatever's going on in his pelvis and we, we hit, when the message is coming all the way back up to his mouth, there, there's a little dopamine, yeah. right? And, and also, and this is Martina's lecture brought this up is that um, uh, proprioceptors get hijacked into nociceptors. Yeah right? So proprioceptors tell you where you are in space. Nociceptors scream about pain. They're pain receptors. Mm -hmm. And so we have to uh, reset the proprioceptors back from that switch to pain recognition back to where I am in space recognition. Yeah. Um, and somebody's, you know, mentioned the fashion. Absolutely. There's a huge fascial connection. Um, there are a lot of people that have used surefoot pads with horses post EPM treatment. So if your horse has EPM, it's really important that you have your vet look at your horse 
get an accurate diagnosis, treat the illness. And in the recovery phase, um, Surefoot has been very successful. We have a number of people that like one horse um, was a dressage horse and after she used, she had EPM and then couldn't perform and after using the pads was back at second level. So it's really important that you check with your vet and get a clear diagnosis and, and that sort of thing before you start with the pads because if it's in an acute phase, it can be the opposite. It can be very unsettling to horses that have uh, a nervous uh, system problem that are uh, neurologic. Um, uh, there's a question from Tiffany about while the horse is on the pads, my horse turns his neck away from me, go away face. She's asking, is that a go away face? Um, after a moment, he then looks at me and turns his head to the other side. Is he inviting me to check in with him while on the pads or should I avoid touching him while he's on the pads? So if the horse reaches over, to, looks at you and it looks like they're offering their muzzle, then they're offering to check in and some horses, again, because the, the nerves here are so wild at helping them reset, um, they may want to actually press their mm -hmm. muzzle on your knuckle, which is why you do this and not this, because this means lick, and that's a different, that's a whole bunch of different stuff. You right. don't want that, you want them to actually press right between their nostrils, and I've had some horses like lean in there, and you don't press in, you let them do it. Um, and if they're doing a go- You just go offer so that they can make offer. contact. Yeah. Just offer, yeah. And if they're yielding their head away, I call it a go away face. Um, they're probably on the pads if they're yielding it in both directions, it's more about them. But if they're looking at you when they do it and they yield far away and sort of, there's an invitation. It's just like if, if sorry, we have a cat here. <laughs> there's, oops, it, there, there goes the cat, there's the, there's the bed. So, <laughs> if, if you invite someone to come over, you do this. You know, you, you, you yield your head away and you're like, come on over here. And there's a welcome, there's a, there's a come to me, there's a soft eye and a soft breath and a soft expression. If you don't want someone to, you don't like something, you go, you know, you make this like horrified face. So look at the facial expression. And the context, because the context. it's not uncommon for horses when they're standing on pads to turn and look one way and look the other. It's not uncommon at all. Right. It may be that they're sensing something down along their side. Right. like a change in the fascial tension. It may be they reach around and actually scratch themselves. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, it, you really have to look at the context. And I would tend to kind of give them a moment to see what the context was before kind of jumping in. Right. Um, my horse often looks one side and then the other when he's getting any kind of body work. Um, so yeah, but yes, yeah. it's like being, you know, it's, it's this tricky thing of being prepared to <laughs> offer assistance when requested yeah. and recognizing when it's being asked for and not when you think it's being asked for. And, and you know, so Dakota, my blind horse, loves the pads. She, and it's really helped. She's gotten more. Um, she cantered with Laura on her saddle recently, just the other day. She hasn't been wanting to do that. Um, and she has been having a flare up in, in her one good eye. So, oh. um, but she's been using the pads and then, and then having so much more movement and freedom in her body, which is really fun. And she will request, now I want your knuckle. I need to push my nose. I need help resetting. And now get away from me. I don't want you to touch me. <laughs> Um, and also you'll see a lot of times the horse will put his head down on the floor and either push against the pad or push or actually do a sort of a, what appears to be a food yep. seeking kind of emotion, right. like lifting through, it's you know, stimulating that. Yep. Yep. I've seen that put, quite a simple solution is you can have like a big barrel right in front of them as an option. If they want to press their nose on something, they can press it on because then you have the lip of the barrel and you have nozzles and you have things and they'll use that. They'll use the surface of that for self-adjusting, and then it's just not a question. Yep, so we have a question here. Um, do the horses tend to stay longer as they use the pads more often? I've only done it once so far and they didn't stay long at all. Just wondering if it might change. Anything can happen. We've had horses that will stand on the pads for a long time and then not want them the next day or the, even the next couple of weeks. We've had horses that have, I had a horse just brush its toe over the pad, yawn like crazy, did not want to stand on them. I mean. The hardest part about Surefoot is really being present with your horse and just observing what they do without judgment or concern. Like, oh, my horse didn't stay as long as your horse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and then look at the context. So, um, so Alex uh, sent me a picture of her thoroughbred and he was rather concerned about the pads and she wasn't sure about them, but every ride got better and the 20 minute sticky walk was gone. Mm. So 
um, duration is not the critical piece. Offering is, observing is, and then feeling what's different or how they move and, and what's different. And then like with the gray horse, with the videos I showed you, um, Laura just kept offering and she thought he was done. She thought he was done. And then she said, would you like this? And she'd go around and see which foot he'd lift and then put a pad under the foot he would pick up. Not try to make him stand on it, but just right. say, this foot, this foot, this foot. Oh, this is the one you want to pat under. And then obliging that. So you're really a facilitator as opposed to um, a director. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it, Luna is that way. You can offer, when you first start, she, you can offer and she'll touch it with each foot and then she'll select the foot. Always, it's always that same hind leg. Um, and then if you ask to pick up another foot to try it, and she's no, she will not. It's lead weight. Feet. She's nope, not. Yeah, it's not coming. It's like a, it's like a dog that you can't pick up. That's right. Yes, that's right. <laughs> um, a question for you here, um, Shanna, Sharon from Ali Doyle. Um, can you read it? Do you have your chat up? No, yeah, I'm going to read it. Yeah, you go ahead and read it because I have to find it. Okay, um, it says, there's a chronic cribber in my barn that I offer my muzzle hand out to check in with, and he came over and seemed to want to communicate. I checked in and did go away face with him. He seemed annoyed with angry ears. He's not mine, so I can't really help him out too much further. He's always very interested in what I'm doing when I'm working with my horse. Is there anything else I can do? So after you do a check-in, so this is normal horse. This is horse on horse. So when horses check in with each other, a, they might touch muzzles or they might do an air greeting from a distance. Like say there, there's a fence, they can't actually get to each other or they're just too far away. So there, so it's like us going, hey, Wendy, right? And she's way over there. And she's like, hey, she looked at me, right? That's great. <laughs> and then when you're done checking in with somebody or something, you lean back. Like she did that too. She leaned in. She did. Right? And then she leaned back, she was done. And so the go away face for them is the lean back. I'm okay, that's nice, now let's have space. Let's connect and let's have respect. Let's connect and let's have respect. And so if he's a cribber, then you've got that, that whole thing going on where he's, he's addicted to the wrong chemicals. He's got, he's got stored pain, memory of pain, active pain. He's got something, going, those receptors that she was talking about before are, are you know, flipped. And so when you say, okay, connect, now let's have respect, he may not be present enough to say, oh, the respect part. Oh, the, I just wanted connection. I didn't know about, so that's the boundary line. And you will have that sometimes with, you're interrupting a pattern. You're interrupting, he, you know, a smoker in the middle of taking a, a hit of the cigarette. You, you knock the cigarette out of his hand and they're like, hey. <laughs> and so that's not uncommon. However, because it fits in with the natural structure of how horses greet, show mutual connection and mutual respect for each other, they will always do a head turn as mutual respect. One might demand another horse turn his head to say, hey, you need to give me a little bit more space. And so depending on what's going on for this horse, if he's, if you're saying, give me a little space, he might be saying, why are you pushing me? Are you bullying me? Am I in trouble? Am I, so there's any number of reasons, you know, where he's got something going on already that asking for a go away face could have been a little bit of a surprise, but it's not incorrect. It's just that it kind of caught him off guard. So you can do these things from more of a distance. You can model go away face yourself. Mm. So you, like what we just did, we got in and we got really, <laughs> hi Wendy. And then I, I'm going to sit back and then she's going to sit. So you can do, you can say hi to a horse and then get out of their bubble. And yeah. she be like, I will go away. I'll step away. Let me model this. There was um, a horse I worked with once who'd been a stallion. He'd been an isolated stallion for five, six years of his life. Then someone bought him, gelded him. and um, and he had developed all these sort of snappy behaviors and he just looked like he was gonna take your skin off every time you got close to him. And she did a wonderful job with him. He was really well trained, but he never let go of those behaviors. He always cribbed and he always looked like he was gonna bite you. Um, she even got him a, I don't know, a little friend horse and then that horse took on those behaviors, started doing it too. So I, she called me and she's like, Can, is there anything, you know, he's 15 years old now, like is, is there any way? So I went through the procedure with him and the first 10 minutes, it was like talking to a blind person. It's like he'd forgotten. He'd been isolated for so long in his life. And all of a sudden, it's the light bulb went off. And he went, I know this stuff. <laughs> and he got so excited. And he wanted to do all the patterns with me. And then he ran outside and he did it with the other horse. And then he went through all the patterns exactly how we had just done it. And then they look at me like, what's next? And I said, um, 
what's next is move your front foot. And they went, right, right, that's what's next. And, they, and then they were like, we're tired. We have to take a nap now. <laughs> So cool. And, and unfortunately, cribbing is one of the most difficult vices to change because the, the chemical release from cribbing is so, it's crack. It's yeah. so strong that, you know, I have somebody right now and they're doing an experiment to see if sure foot pads can help with cribbing. And, and I, I mean, I just don't know. Right. Um, and so we're really all following this case. Um, very, very interested. Um, because it's, it's probably the one that people have the least answers for. There's right. some, you know, we, we did have a we, really good success story with a cribber. Yeah, well, we had that. And then, you know, um, one other horse that we know, we got um, in touch with a vet and for the gastric, um, well, the horse is on the Outlast, which is a Purina product for gastric problems, as well as a thing, I don't know anything about, like, it's called the sponge and you get it from your vet. And it's supposed to help clear out the stomach, especially after a horse has been on antibiotics. And we actually, uh, mummy sometimes cribs our horse and- uh, And she with, was on a course of antibiotics for a tick. Yeah, oh, and so yeah. giving her the sponge, she stopped cribbing. So like, there definitely could be an ulcery type of component with- Yeah, I really, and, I think so. I yeah, think and it's one of those things, you know, it, you, again, you have to look deeper and try to see if you can solve the underlying cause if there is one. Um, so, but it's a fascinating story about that horse and not having language and then having to go. Right, yeah. It. Oh, it was so cool. I wish we had it on video. I know. Yeah. You never have, you never have your video camera. I know. Yeah. I'm going to read another question here. Um, I'm fascinated with the help, with helping the horses reach the serotonin release during groundwork. The popular idea of giving the release of pressure followed by a quick rub as a reward is what I am familiar with. Your comment a minute ago in reference to Dr. Peters has made me wonder what about that. Is it better to not offer a rub a reward if the horse does the task, but rather just let him relax and process the information on his own? Is even a positive rub actually interfering with the learning process? Hmm. Very um, good question. Yes, excellent question. Go and watch Dr. Peters' talks on the brain um, because they're fascinating. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, to sort of a short answer is, leaving them alone and not disturbing that process is really the key. Um, and it's just like you, you know, you've done something and say you've learned something new and you've stopped for a moment and you're pausing and then the phone rings or somebody runs in and wants your attention or distracts you and you lose that moment. And so, you know, it's not like you have to let them sit there every single time, but certainly like in the beginning, if you wanna make a better connection, nerves that fire together, wire together. So the sooner you can acknowledge uh, the action and the response, and that's the, the whole thing for me behind clicker training is actually to teach the people to be better observers because you have to click mm -hmm. when you actually see the action, right? right? Um, but wiring it together, and you, you don't have to use a clicker, but anytime you acknowledge the response within half a second, you're gonna start wiring together. And then if you let the system rest, it's gonna record, oh, that, that. That's what you were asking. That's what you're talking about. I call it click, click and breathe. Yeah. Click and breathe. Because we, we get so, we hold our breath, especially when we're focused and concentrating. And so if you're, you're like, okay, touch, you know, whatever, you touch the object, <laughs> you know, and they touch it and we go click, click, ah, you know, more things. So if you, if you click and breathe, your, your breath is sending a message like we got it right all's well. Yeah. All's well. And you can always have an agreement. Like some horses are real touchy feely more than others. Some yeah. actually don't like to be touched at all, but you can have an agreement. Like you can, the, where the jugular groove is, that's where the, the, the vagal nerves kind of rest in that groove. And if you stroke downhill, a light, long downhill stroking like this, not, not this, which is stimulating, but just long downhill stroking along the jugular groove. A lot of horses find that like, candy they love it so you can have certain kinds of touch that you and your horse they might like the front of their chest they might like their knee massage you never know but if you find a kind of touch that you and your horse both recognize as a reward touch then you could offer it but you look for the horse to say nah right i don't want it as a or or lean into it go yeah i want that's that feels like reward to me so really just let them be the guideposts instead of ins like, I'm going to touch you. Yeah, yeah. 
And that's really interesting with the jugular, because I've seen that work with calming. Um, and I didn't realize the vagus was, but that makes sense. The, yeah. the vagal nerve is lying in there. And if you quietly, softly, not hard, softly yeah. stroke, that you can, you can activate that relaxation. Um, we, have an, we have a couple of questions. So um, let's see, with my, with my first experience Saturday, my mayor accepted the, to stand on the, on the double physio pad. I think she means the full physio pad for quite a while, which I was doing some Masterson light work, then gently pawed the pad back toward her hinds without moving her stance. Interesting, then multiple yawns. So um, horses will absolutely move pads to the foot they want. Um, so she may have been requesting a back foot. Um, and so it looks like you're right on there. Um, sometimes in the beginning, especially, you wanna keep the sessions short because you are activating a lot of things and um, you also might want to just do the pads for a while and not combine in the beginning because you have to think about how much input your the nervous system is receiving. So um, just think about you've got time, especially now, um, and maybe just do uh, smaller bits of separated things before you start combining. Yep. Anything? Um... <laughs> I have a little note from Brad. Oh, you can't see it. Okay. So, Sounds like husbands would like their vagal nerve stroke this way too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, one of the horses I work with the pads in addition to the Masterson method wants to use the pads without standing on it, but putting a pad under his belly, mm. showing a lot of signs other horses have on pads. Wow, that's a new one. That's, that's cool. cool. Yeah. Um, I have not done that, but uh, you know, like I said, when I watched this gray horse, there are things I still haven't seen with Surefoot. Um, and I do know of someone who put a pad on the horse's sacrum and saw a oh. huge amount of release. I think it was a medium pad and they just set it on the horse's sacrum and all kinds of things started happening. Well, so, Rudy, I have a question for you. Speaking of electromagnetism, um, I was just looking at some of the Heart Math Institute stuff recently. Oh, and, yeah. It's you cool. know, and what, what, ask, what, what part of our system is electric and what part of our system is magnetic? Because there's, there's two different aspects to that. There's, there's electromagnetism. It's not like electric magnets. It's like there's a magnetism in, we have iron in our blood. You know, there's, 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 we're uh, subject to magnetic forces and there's electrical stuff going on. Our brains are like little electrical storms going on. But, but our cells have electrons. Yes. So every cell has an elect, has, more than a electron has electrons that are moving around the central atom. Right. So and the heartbeat. Yeah. The heartbeat has both. Yeah. Right. So I wonder about the pad touching different parts of the body. And I was going to ask you, um, what do you know about electromagnetism as a reverb going through that pad? I don't. But it was like a to like. Hmm. Yeah. So, so, you know, I keep asking myself, do the pads dampen? In other words, like, are they dampening vibration? Are they dampening electromagnetic fields or absorbing electromagnetic? You know, I really don't know. I guess we'd have to have some way of measuring the electromagnetic field and then seeing what happens when they're on the pads or the pad is underneath them. What if we could have, what if there was a sensor that you, you set up like, a, you know, like there's a, a, we have a thing over our modem to dampen the, oh, yeah. the field. So what if there was a, a sensor that could measure, because there, there are sensors that measure how much emissions are or happening. Or even just a heat sensor. I mean, we can get, that's an easy one to get. So we have people with thermography units that are starting to do experiments, um, looking at changes in blood flow, uh, using pads. Um, I don't know where those studies are in terms of their process right now. Um, but I do know that they're, um, Joe, your daughter has a thermography camera. Maybe this would be a good experiment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sending a message. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many ways we want to uh, explore and kind of figure it out. And um, we're just, you know, some of it requires some really technical equipment and some, and the, probably the biggest thing is the control. In right. other words, you have to control the number of people, um, the density, the pad, many factors because without having strict controls, you have to have such a huge number of horses to right. see statistical significance. Right. And so that requires like research centers and places where they can do all those controls 
to yeah. do some of this research. The but minor, we could contact the Minor Institute. Maybe Karen Vassell over there would want to do I don't that. know her. Maybe we can talk yeah, about that's a It's a uh, research institute, and that's what they do is research. Cool. All so right. They're, they're pretty cool people. Um, somebody's asking, can you talk more about cribbing? My horse is a cribber from almost birth. That's my understanding. <coughs> I've had him since one years old and big time cribber now six years old. He's been using pads, he likes them, has seen him sway, hind end going inwards, et cetera. Could I, could I help him get off cribbing? Uh, good luck. <laughs> I mean, once they're a cribber, like you said, the chemistry is very addicting. Yeah. I have had, there was a cribber, probably the worst cribber I've ever met in my life. I've never, she was a, she was a five pack a day smoker, this horse, you know, like she was just not, was like she was wild. skinny because she, she would not eat, she would crib. So, and then, and the woman, the, the owner had done literally everything, everything that she, you could pot and she just, you know, she's like, I just have to surrender. I'm not going to just keep her in a cribbing collar all day, you know? Right. So, and the horses, she was out with a herd of horses, plenty of room, lots of, um, so we did the, I did a whole round. It was two hours of you know, speaking to her using horse speak and communicating. And it took a long time for her to kind of, come for like it was like she was lost in there somewhere and when she finally started to really communicate with me she had of these light bulb moments and it was like something switched for her in her self-awareness and i don't know what happened if she and i think this horse had come off the track at one point but the the history wasn't it didn't sound that traumatic at the track she kind of did one season there and then was sold off um but when she had this moment where she had a breakthrough, she went to crib and stopped mm -hmm. before cribbing oh. and had the ears did that and she thought inside you could herself. see her thinking about it. It was she so rocked. Cool. I call it rocking the baby. She rocked. And then she looked at the other horses. It was almost like for the first time she really saw them. And they ran to her and they all started greeting her and sniffing all her buttons. And they kind of took her away from the fence. And they all did the greeting ritual with her. And then they all collectively took her out to the backfield. Wow. And that, and that was, you know, the, the story that came back weeks later, she was still a cribber, but it wasn't that. It wasn't this insane, I can't even eat. I can't, she was actually eating. She was grazing. She was spending most of her time out with the herd and cribbing was just something, if a fence was nearby, she'd be like, oh yeah, you know, yeah. I, I still like it, but it wasn't the same uh, intensity. Uh, so I think, you know, get the teeth checked too. Like we were talking about this really um, occlusal therapy, which yeah, is so important. The natural balance dentistry, it's amazing. Yeah, you, you can't, you know, and, the, and ulcers. I mean, it's, you've got to look at the whole package. And the sponge, it's, I, it's a miracle. Like I couldn't oh. believe it. I was like, looked and I'm like, mommy, cause it would be, she'll have her grain and she'll run up and um, crib. crib on the post. And then after, two days after doing the sponge, she ran up and went right to the hay rather than went wow. to the hay. So there's hope. Yeah, I talk to your vet. Try it's called the sponge. I don't know anything about it, like what its actual name is, but I think it's actually sea sponge. Okay, it's a powder. Um, Throw it in some grain, like a few tablespoons. So we have another question. How should I address the obsessive licking that my mare does? She usually licks the metal gate or metal latches often after eating. Also, she will lick me in my clothes if I don't move away. So that's usually the they need to reset and they're when i've met mouthy horses they're either kind of funny mouthy like lick 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 or suck on the lead rope or chew on my reins or knock everything off the shelf or or even aggressive mouthy horses when you can offer them the correct mouth massage which is using the back of your knuckle because you don't want anything that they can get really get a hold of with their teeth so this is a safety mechanism um and you and it's just like with the sure foot pads where you know a horse might step a toe on and be done so if this is a muzzle i might go in and stroke down once between the nostrils right between you can't be on either nostril or on the side and do not do the side of the mouth it's right between the nostrils and down the acupuncture point gv26 is right here it's for shock and trauma and all kinds of things you go in and you go down once and you'll see some horses will go and it's like the the whole like what just happened to me and they even like leave you know and then come back a few minutes later and they might present the muzzle and go do that again 
but the, the touch, the contact has to be um, like as though you were stroking down the skin of an orange. So if you were pressing on the skin of an orange, you're not punching and you're not oh so soft. You've got to be like the skin of an orange. So maybe practice on a piece of paper. It's a great way to practice, right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, let's see, so, someone's asking, would it be better to use verbal praise rather than physical gesture? You know, so much of that depends on the individual. Um, some people love praise, other people don't talk to me, some horses respond better, you know, so you really, I think that in that instance, it's, it's figuring out what is the thing that that particular horse really responds to. We like to use yes. Yeah, we use yes. Yeah. I, yeah. And then we I get, have to be you know, careful with good boy. Time. If I say good boy, my horse slams on the brakes. <laughs> 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 I, I used it to teach him uh, when I was um, lunging him over. I don't have a, a fence. So everything, if I'm lunging him, it has to be on a line because I don't have a fence in my arena. But I, he would rush his fences. So I taught him to jump on the line and I would say good boy and he would stop. So um, now if I say good boy, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> you have an emergency stop. That's great. <laughs> um, and then somebody's asked if Jillian Kreinberg's, uh, Kreinbring is going to be available like this. Absolutely. It's going to be on Monday, the 25th. Um, I can't remember what time we've set a time, but I'll send out an email just like I do for all the webinars. So if you join my email list at murdochmethod.com, join the email list. On Sunday of every week, Saturday or Sunday, this week it was Sunday, I send out an email with all the guests for the week and links to all the guests so that you can join. Webinars are limited in their number, so you do wanna sign up early. Um, and all of the videos are available afterward on my uh, YouTube channel, Surefoot Equine. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna keep going with these webinars as, as long as uh, I can. <laughs> oh, yeah, somebody's saying it's, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the, uh, the, the, the most exciting thing since the last time we talked was the fact that Rocky's edema was relieved from standing on the surefoot pads twice. And one, one was half hearted, like he stood on it for a second and moved off. Mm -hmm. And then the second time he was on him for, you know, seven to 10 minutes. And, and the fact that, um, that it was a lot of edema. I mean, it was really, I was getting really worried. Like he pulled mm -hmm. a stitch and he's got fluid. I don't know what's going on. And, and it's basically gone. Wow, that is fascinating. That's yeah. really cool. Um, I'm just going to look quickly through the comments here in, on the chat and see if there's anything else, if you uh, want to share anything else with them right now while I do that. Uh, I think it is the bio sponge. They were, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said, we can just hang out here with you three all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Feelings mutual. Yes. Um, when when I said put the pad on the sacral region, that's that. All they did was just they just placed the pad on his sacrum. We're gonna try that. This yeah. pelvis. I mean, I think it sounds crazy, sure. um, but you know, uh, my horse turns out the leg when I work her quads. Often when looking back at me, she asks me to work deeper. Maybe. Um, again, it's context. Um, my m one mare taught me how to give her a treat she lifts up her back leg and I come from behind the back leg and she reaches a, re, would reach her head around and take the treat from under like up by her udder and then she taught that to my other horses so now my horses when they when I'm at the back end to do a stretch they automatically pick up their leg and want me to give them the treat underneath the back leg so you know you do have to look at context mm -hmm. um, with certain behaviors um, bio sponge supports healthy gut gastro okay so somebody's put that up in the That's chat awesome. platinum performance yep. excellent um, is there anyone in Eastern Mass for the Surefoot pad therapy? Okay, A, Surefoot is not a therapy because um, it's really an education and it's an offer to the horses. And um, yes, there are people in Eastern Mass. Um, Becky Kells uh, is in Eastern Mass. And on my Surefoot equine uh, website, my new website that's up, we're listing practitioners. Um, they're not all up there yet, but we're, because we only launched last Friday. Um, but we are working on getting everybody listed and up on the website so that you can find people and it'll have contact information. Um, so let's see. Uh, oh, this is a, we have a first time listener to a webinar. Woohoo! Woo <laughs> there, uh, there was a question someone put the uh, horse on a. No, this one right here. Oh, when yeah. you introduce the pads, do you use any kind of body language to let the horse know what you're up to? Um, yeah, so once you know how to do the greeting ritual, you can greet with anything. So then you're greeting. You're using the same gestures for greeting, like if I'm gonna shake Laura's hand, shake my hand, hi there, right? So that's a, that's a greeting. 
Uh, so with a horse, you do the greeting is muzzle to muzzle. Hey there, how's it going? So that's it. So now something in my hand, like a brush or the you know anything. Oh, I'm greeting with this now. So I want you to greet this. So check out my saddle. Check out my thing. What? So check out my sure foot pad. Here, greet my pad. And the horse says, Oh, I'm greeting the. They put their nose on and go, What the heck? Well, and that was so fascinating because when I. I mean, I, I would hold out a pad and offer it to the horse, and I teach people to do that all the time, but I never knew it was a greeting till I met Sharon. And of course, I walk up to the horse and I hold the pad out, and she's like, oh, greeting. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so someone tried the pads with a blind horse for the first time. He would have thought I'd set his hoof on fire. Any thoughts to comfort him as I suspect he could really benefit? That's you, Wendy. So the, the, my first question is, did you come up on the blind side or the vision side? Um, and how well did you allow him to like check out the pad? So it may be that he couldn't see it well or you, you surprised him. And then it's really important that you start with a harder pad, not a soft pad that's gonna have too much give because it can startle them. Um, like that's where the physio pad could be really handy because it's a lower profile and it's gonna be more stable and it's not gonna have to give. And the other thing is I would take the pad and stroke the horse so that they feel it. And so that it's not just something that surprises them. It sounds like it was a bit of a surprise. I might even stand on it myself where they can see me with the good eye and I might even have another horse that's not blind on the pads in the vicinity of the blind horse so that they get the feeling from the horse that's on the pad. So you really have to break it down for these horses um, because they may not understand what's going on or understand how to process and they've figured out how to deal with their world. They're like, okay, I know where everything is and I can mind my way along and now you've changed things and I'm not sure what to do. Oh, so so the, the answer is he has no good side that so oh. be blind on both sides. So I would stand on the pad and touch the horse. Yeah, great idea. I would stand on the pad and touch the horse's wither because they're going to feel you. That's what that horse in the, in the beginning of this conversation, the horse was touching the, the field of the horse in front who's on the pads. So if you stand on the pad and you touch the horse, something is going to get transmitted. And I would also pick the horse's feet up and put them down several times and do a lot of like, um, you know, there's this leg massage where you sort of circle the leg and relax and massage the leg and pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down several times in a row and then touch the toe in the air, touch the toe to the pad. Like you have the foot up and just touch it, but don't have them stand on it right away. Just You can also pick up the foot and just put the pad. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, on the yeah. foot that way and just press it a little and then yeah. take it away and put the foot back down, yep. Um, it really is a matter of starting to think, how can I break this down into little tiny pieces? Right. Um, so I always talk about an alphabet, and in order to spell walk, you need a W, an A, an L, and a K. And if you don't have the letters, you can't spell walk. Well, in this blind horse's case, I think you have to break down and spell each letter, mm -hmm. like break it down into as many little tiny pieces as you can, and then slowly connect two letters into H-O-O, -O, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and just very slowly process that. I, I just think it was, it was unexpected and she yeah. wasn't sure. And, you know, some horses think that the ground might give way and that's dangerous. And so you right. have to consider yeah. that. Um, hi, Suzanne. Um, she's got to go because we've uh, run over time, but that's oh. glad you were here. Um, first time, horse, first time on pad wanted to bite the pad. How do you respond? I don't let them bite it. <laughs> um, they are not warranted against bites. Um, you could let him touch it, you can stroke him with it, but I wouldn't let him put his teeth on it. I don't know, Sharon, if you have some comments about teeth. Yeah, my, one of my horses just says, this is so good on my feet, it must be good on my stomach too, and she just wants to eat the thing. Yeah. And we just have to say no. Yeah, go away face. Go away yeah. face, no, Two don't, fingers don't bite the cheek. it. Right, not the mouth, the, the cheek. So yeah. when you touch here near the back of the cheek, that's where horses touch each other to say, hey, cut it out, so. Yeah, so you, you know, you just wanna use good sense and um, sometimes they wanna explore things with their mouth and sometimes they paw them a little bit, like when I see them pawing them, to me, it's a, a bit of confusion. They mm -hmm. feel something different, they're not sure what it is, they wanna try and investigate, they might use their mouth, they might use their foot, but you know, you wanna remove the pad when you start to see that this could cause damage to your pad because they're, used and you want to give them a break from it anyway so that they can just sit for a moment and think about what they experience. Here's that pause to yeah. just integrate, right? Yeah. Um, 
It's like Sesame Street. Word of the day, pause. Pause, pause and breathe. Yeah, pause, pause and breathe. P-A-W-S, pause. No, pause. <laughs> what do you mean, P-A, P, oh, you said P-A-W-S. P-A-W-S. I was, <laughs> wow, that is, I must be tired. Using task analysis for those horses that are blind or more sensitive. I'm not sure what task analysis is, but maybe that's breaking things down. Mm -hmm. Uh, What about adjusting their mouth with the pad? Mm, I'm not so sure about that, but there's a a question mark. Um, So, you know, you just want to be aware that your pads could be damaged by, you know, excessive pawing and teeth um, and, you know, take care of them. And also recognize that a lot of times in that moment, there's confusion and you don't want to leave the horse in this confused state. You want to give, remove it for a minute and let them think about it, take them for a walk. Um, Sharon, how, how do you view when you see a horse confused about something? What's a good recommendation? Exactly what you just said. Just, just get, just like what we would do. If you're confused and someone's saying, Try it, try it, try it. No, no, try it, try it. It's gonna be fine. It's gonna be relax, fine. You're gonna love relax, it. Try it, try it, try it. You know, you so you know, it's just too much input. Um, we, we function the same way, and so if it, what would help a a person, what would help a human being who's confused or who's kind of overwhelmed? Most of the time, we want to take a walk. We're like, I'll be right back. Yeah, I'll be right back. You know, and we go somewhere. Even if we're in uh, back in the day when we could go to restaurants, we'd be like, I'm going to the bathroom. You know. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a walk. I'll be back, and you, and you need that motion to kind of sort things through. So just take them for a, a little circle, yeah. And then let them let them try it again. Yeah, and that's what I you know I recommend is just you know give them a break, take a little rest, even go let them pick some grass for a moment, you know, so that you're still processing when you're doing that. You know, mm-hmm. when you think about you've thought about like learning a new computer, like Zoom, learning a new computer mm-hmm. program. And then you go out and I go out in my garden, which is where I do a lot of my processing. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, oh, oh, that's not so, hard. I get it. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a few more questions and then we're gonna wrap this up. Um, somebody's asking about the pad under the belly. I think it was on the ground, but you know, you could try holding it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, was the stroking the orange for cribbers or just horses in general? That's for doing, for uh, there's a hundred different reasons why you would want to do mouth massage uh and you can even just offer it on a horse who doesn't seem to need it but they might really like it and so just touching an orange is how to get the right touch right the right pressure and the right feel because some people are too much or too not enough or they don't you know so if you can if you can put your knuckle on an orange and round the orange that's enough Yep. Um, would the pads be something I could introduce in a way to relax my mare for the farrier? Absolutely. Um, if I start off with the pads. So when you have um, the horse that's nervous for the farrier, the first thing you want to do is start working with the pads at well ahead of the next visit of your farrier. So don't wait till the day he's coming and then run out with your pads and see if you can make a change. Um, start well ahead. Use the pads, you know, frequently. Again, your horse is going to determine how often. And then before your farrier gets there, put your horse on the pads. Um, That's one of the reasons, the whole reason we designed the physio pad used to be called the farrier pad because we wanted to make the horses calmer and safer for everyone involved. But now a lot of other people use that pad, so we changed the name to physio. Um, But that's a great pad to use actually during the process of being trimmed or shod because it helps the horses with stability. Um, Laura, there's one here for you. Are you on the chat? It says, um, Laura worked with Hunter at my home. She is awesome, as <laughs> you ladies are too. Lucky our horses have been introduced to Fabulous kind of an empathetic um, animal educated horse advocates. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Karine. Um, and then there's a, uh, you mentioned the sit down button. And is that in your book, the sit down button? The, the, the third book. book, the new book, I talk about the sit down button and the bridge of the nose buttons, which are two very sensitive zones. So I left them out of the first book because I, you know, I didn't want to include information that anyone could get in trouble with. Like even talking about mouth massage is people touch their horses. You're going to put a bit in there. You got, you know, like pe- the horses get dentistry. So it's worth it to learn how to correctly touch their muzzle. And some horses don't want it just to put, you know, just like with the pads, they, yeah. they touch it and they're done. Some yeah. it's like a, a quick second and they're done. And some horses have had trauma to the mouth. They've been twitched and they're like, don't get anywhere near me. So if that's the case, that's okay. It's not the end of the world. Um, I have had some horses who were really highly aggressive 
and I wasn't going to get my knuckle anywhere near their face. So I used the end of um, crop. a crop. So like the rubber end of a crop. And I did the same thing. It was just in and down. And that horse very quickly went, oh, this is something different. So I think like what, what we're talking about here when we're saying uh, introducing something to the horse is you want them to have agency. So I don't want you to grab your horse by the back of the head and say, I'm going to rub your mouth now, OK? <laughs> I like that, didn't you, Laura? I can see that. The face <laughs> nervous how happy she is. She Don't can't it. help it. That's the it's right there. <laughs> uh, yep. Um, and let's see, I have, um, my horse lets out a snort when he sees the pads. I would tell you to slow down. Um, if a horse is snorting, then I would slow down. I'd, I'd present it and take it away. I might stand at it myself, have another horse stand on the pad within sight. Um, you have to really pay attention to those little, you know, ear cocks, head cocks, little snorts, and because be they can escalate. Um, and so it's just a warning sign to slow down. And also um, with processing and also approaching, especially with an, a, for, a foreign object, you know, being mindful of your core. So your belly button, where is it pointing? You know, sometimes what we tell our folks is, especially if the horse is on a pad having a nice time, turn your belly button off and you can offer your palm. And we say it's a hold hand and just like, I've got you, I'm holding you, holding space for you. And even with farrier work or anything that you're trying to do like on cross ties, being mindful of the core and putting your hand up and saying, I've got your back. And it's a profound thing that horses love. It's an intrinsic message. Yeah. Um, last question. I don't have pads yet. Uh, what would I choose, angled or flat? You always want to start with a pair of flat pads. You can add the angled pads later. Um, and by the way, we're doing a special this week. We have 30% off the Harmony, actually for month of May, 30% off a Harmony equine muzzle if you buy a package of firm and firm slants. Sorry, firm and firm slants. I've been talking for an hour and a half. Um, you can go to my uh, uh, website murdochmethod.com and go to the Surefoot Sets page and you'll find that package there. Um, it is muzzle season, the grass is growing, it's been cool weather and it's really important to be able to pay attention to your horse's weight and, and not let them get in the danger zone. Um, Dr. Harmon did an excellent webinar last week that you can find on my Surefoot Equine YouTube channel to learn about the signs for laminitis and understanding the difference between PPID and IR. Um, Sharon and Laura, I think I've talked out to them. Thank you so much. This was like the rapid fire hour and a half. I mean, it was just flew by. And yes. um, great questions, awesome conversation. Once again, just thank you so much for joining me. It's, yeah. it's such a pleasure. And I'm sure we'll have to do this again. Yeah, definitely. It seems to have to be a two week routine. I miss yeah, it. A, I'm loving it. <laughs> two weeks on Monday, it's the thing I look forward to, I'll tell you. Um, all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day and enjoy your horses. Take all care, right. Bye. See bye. ya. Thank you.